Well, good morning. <clears throat> this is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Hope everybody's doing okay today and are ready to continue our study in the book of Revelation. I see folks joining on here. <clears throat> good morning, Danny and Wayne, Sheila, Anita and Roger. Glad to have you guys here today. Deborah, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, Deborah and Brian and Lyle. <laughs> Folks, keep joining on. Glad to see everybody. Good morning, Debbie. Glad to see you here as well. All right, we are ready for Revelation chapter 2 today. Hope you have your Bibles out and are ready to study. Uh, we introduced it yesterday, so let me go ahead and pull the outline up on the screen here for you. We are getting into now the main targets, if you will, of the letters, or of the book, rather, of Revelation. You have letters written to the seven churches of Asia, which today, if you were to look on a map, we'd be looking in the region of Turkey. All right, so I don't know if you, how many of you have a map out in front of you, but that's that's basically where we are looking at these seven churches of Asia. When you, when you open the book of Revelation, good morning, Joni and Jean, glad to have you ladies on here today. When you open the book of Revelation, as we pointed out yesterday, there are several things you've got to remember. The first three verses are extremely important, obviously, but then so is verse 4 of chapter 1. We're talking about the audience, and that's who we're going to be looking at today. Seven letters, all right? Seven, well, you know, we typically think of letters as something longer. These are relatively short. The longest of the seven letters is actually here in chapter 2. It's the last one to the church at Thyatira, but um, each congregation is addressed separately, individually, and here's, here's how we're going to break down the text as we go through this particular chapter. Um, obviously, we're going to break it down congregation by congregation. We're going to look at the diagnosis of each. We're going to look at the positives and the negatives that were given by the Lord, and then some warnings and promises. We're not going to, to read each verse, uh, but we will note things from each uh, each section of Revelation chapter 2. All right, so the first of the seven letters to the churches of Asia is written to the church at Ephesus. Now, we are familiar with the, the Lord's church in Ephesus. We've, we're introduced to it in Acts chapter 19 when Paul went there to preach the gospel. Um, Acts chapter 20, the letter to the church at Ephesus, obviously, the book of Ephesians. Now, this is Jesus' personal message to them. This congregation is diagnosed as a church that has left its first love. And so I have up here on the screen the loveless church. But with each of these seven, there, there's five of the seven, there's something negative. There's only two of which there's nothing negative said. Um, but with each, you have positives. You have good things that are mentioned. And so that's what I want to look at first. Uh, good morning, Diana. Good morning, Mom. Glad to have you guys on here today. One of the things, too, that I want to do is... It, it, this. Now, this is kind of interesting to me. This is not in the outline that's up here on the screen, but with each letter, Jesus introduces himself in a certain way, and it's each, each of these descriptions are related to something that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 1. It's just To me, it's just interesting to notice the ties. Uh, to Revelation 1. So in, in chapter 2 here in verse 1, as Jesus is speaking to the church at Ephesus, you will notice it says, to the angel at the church of Ephesus. And I didn't really talk about this yesterday. Um, the word angel, uh, I of course did a, a, ser a video series on angels a while back. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, and it simply means messenger. There are varying views. Um, I've got around 25 commentaries on the book of Revelation. And there are different views on who these angels were. Some people believe that the angels of the churches, because again, each letter starts out that way, um, to the angel of the church of, you know, fill in the blank. Some people believe that the angel of the churches were the elderships. Some believe that it was the local preacher. Uh, some believe that the angel of the churches was basically the, um, the way I describe it as the heart or the spirit of each of those congregations. And, and frankly... I'm not settled on any of those. I don't think you can nail it down perfectly, but whatever the case may be, uh, Jesus is addressing each congregation individually, and to Ephesus, he says, he identifies himself as 
He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Touched on that yesterday. That's at the end of chapter 1. That is a, uh, it, it, it lets this church know, and in fact it lets all seven churches know that he is in the midst of them. He's holding them in their hand. He, he knows what's going on with them. He's aware, as you look at this outline here, he knows what the diagnosis is for each. He knows the positives, the negatives. This is who he is. He is the head of the church. All right, He's the head of the body, which is the church, rather. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. So that's how he identifies himself to the church at Ephesus. Now let's look at their positives. All right, Verses 2 and 3. I know your works. He says that to every one of the seven. Your labor, your patience, I'm looking at a New King James here. That word might be better rendered in the English as perseverance. Um, they were persevering all of, uh, through all the persecution. That you cannot bear those who are evil. It's all good so far. You've tested those who say they are apostles and are not. All right, John obviously was an apostle. There were false apostles present in the first century. There were those who claimed to be and were not. I mean, Paul talks about that too. You found them liars, the text says here. Uh, that's not good. Found them to be liars, okay? And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now, it's interesting because, as you notice here on the outline, it's called the loveless church. But they're, they're doing a lot of good things. There's no question about that, and especially when you look there at the end of verse 3. You've labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. And then you go down to verse, uh, verse 6, and it says, But this you have. Okay, so here's something else that's positive, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This is interesting because the Nicolaitans are actually mentioned a couple of times, but we really don't know anything about them. Uh, you know, commentators give speculation that it was a group who practiced immorality, uh, but it's all speculation. History doesn't really tell us anything about this group of people called the Nicolaitans. There's a lot of good about Ephesus. What's their problem? Well, that's verses 4 and 5. Um, verse 4, nevertheless, a lot of good, nevertheless. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So it's what we would call the loveless church. Repent, or rather, remember, therefore, from, from where you have fallen. Now, that word fallen is important because a lot of people believe that's not possible, that Christians can't fall. Well, certainly they can. You have fallen, and therefore you need to repent, and you need to do the first works. Notice this, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand, from its place unless you repent. The source of light, that's what the lampstand is. And again, Christians are the, the light of the world. Uh, we're shining forth as lights, Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. He tells the church, listen, you're doing a lot of good, but you're just going through the motions. Your heart's not in what you're doing. And if you don't repent, you're not going to be my church anymore. I'm not going to recognize you as my body of people. And this is, and by the way, we notice this with all of these, well, all, with five of the seven who need to repent, congregational repentance. You know, all of us, myself included, we need to repent individually from time to time. But, you know, it may be the case that an entire church, an entire congregation needs to repent. Um, in this case, again, you have a lot of good things. But they're doing, they're, they've left their first love. They've, they're doing it without heart. Again, the, the best way I know how to describe that is they're going through the motions. Um, that's, that's not good enough. Uh, we need to serve God from the heart. So there's your negative. And I mean, that's a big one, obviously. So here's the promise made to them. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, and by the way, overcome is your main word throughout the book of Revelation. It's used at least 13 times throughout Revelation. That's what this book is all about. It's about overcoming. He who overcomes will give, uh, I will give to him, uh, give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, we, we run into the tree of life a little bit later in uh, the book of Revelation, the end of the book, in fact. We're talking about eternal life. If we overcome, we will have eternal life in paradise. Well, 
paradise. I, you know, I think of Luke 23, 43. Today you shall be with me in paradise. That word paradise in the Greek means garden. Um, it's not talking about going back to the Garden of Eden or anything like that. It's talking about being with him in paradise, in a place of comfort. So there's your letter to the church at Ephesus. Now, one of the one of the interesting things to me is, so we talked about the dating of the book of Revelation. Some people believe it's an early book, that it was written before A.D. 70. Some believe, like I, myself, I believe it was written near the end of the first century, around A.D. 95. So the book of Ephesians that Paul wrote was written, you know, most people estimate its date of writing to be anywhere from A.D. 62 to 64. If the book of Revelation was written in A.D. 65 to 68, they left their first love within three years. I just don't buy that. I don't see an entire congregation needing to repent within three years, by the way, of Ephesians 1.1, which says, you are faithful in the Lord. To me, the, the message of these churches, uh, the message to these churches in Revelation indicate a late date of authorship for the book of Revelation. An entire congregation is not going to forsake its first love within three years of being called faithful. All right? That takes a while. Anyway, let's move on to the second letter, the church at Smyrna. Now, this is one of the two of which nothing negative is said. You can see here on your screen, verses 8 through 11. Um, these things says, The first and the last who was dead and came to life. Again, that's, that calls us back to chapter 1. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He's the firstborn from the dead. His resurrection assures our resurrection. I know your works. Again, that's said to every congregation. What are they working through? Or, you know, what, what are they working in? Notice the language here. The tribulation, poverty, parenthetical statement here, but you're rich. You know, physically, they may, may have not had everything. They may not have been wealthy, but they were rich people in God's eyes. And you know, that's all that matters. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Um, Jewish persecution was one of the main difficulties that the church faced in the first century. Seems to be the case here with Smyrna, too, uh, being persecuted uh from a Jewish source. His, his uh, positives there in verse 9, this is a good congregation, enduring through difficult times. And then here's your warning in verse 10. It's getting ready to be really difficult. The devil's going to cast some of you into prison for 10 days. Now, 10 days is not a literal week and three days. Okay, again, we get into some symbolism here. It's, it's the concept of a perhaps a short but indefinite period of time. Talk, just talking about persecution. You're going to face persecution. You need to be ready for that. And his message to them is, um, be faithful unto, until death. And, and I really prefer how the King James reads here. It says, unto death. Until death might imply that, you know, just live your whole life and be faithful until you die. What he's really saying here in the context of persecution is you need to be faithful even if it leads to your death, unto death. Again, that's what he's talking about here. And I will give you the crown of life. So your promise then is, uh, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now that's mentioned several times in the book of Revelation, the second death. It's mentioned in Revelation 20 and verse 6, Revelation 21, 14, and uh, Revelation 21 and verse 8. Now, Revelation 21.8 gives us the best indication of what the second death is, and it's, it's eternal death. It's eternal separation from God. That's the lake of fire, okay? That's hell. That's the second death. But you know what? If we overcome, we don't have to be afraid of that second death. And again, overcome is the key to the book of Revelation. Good congregation there in Smyrna, even in the face of trials. All right, your third letters to the church at Pergamos, you can see up here. Their diagnosis was doctrinal compromise. And this, this has to do, there's actually an Old Testament example pulled in here uh, from Balaam. We're not going to go into all the details, but read sometime Numbers chapters 22 through 25. And you'll learn about Balaam, uh, the Israelites approaching Moab, and the king of Moab, Balak, wanting to get rid of them. But anyway... It's all that, that story is about compromise, or that account is about compromise. And so this church here in Smyrna is, is accused, rightfully so by Jesus, of compromising. All right? Um, but let's look at their positives 
first. Verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. You notice twice it says where Satan dwells. And it's interesting when you look at some of the history of Smyrna, we're not given any really in the New Testament. You have to go back in and do some secular history digging here. This was kind of provincial capital in this region, and it was known for paganism. Uh, it was known for idol worship and things of this nature. So this church is dwelling in the midst of that type of, a, of an environment, and they have some positives. Again, you look at verse 13. There, there are some who are holding fast. They're, they're not denying the faith, even when people were being killed for their faith. But here's their problem, again, verses 14 and 15. There are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Again, con, uh, compromise. Read Numbers chapters 22 through 25, and you'll, you'll understand that a little bit better. Three things were, were being done. They put a stumbling block, um, verse 14, eating things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So you've got compromise, but then you have these Nicolaitans mentioned again. And, and again, as I already said, we don't know anything really about the Nicolaitans. But what we do know is that Jesus hates what they do and what they teach. Some in the church had begun to adopt, um, adopt that position, if you will, or adopt that style. So you have a lot of negatives here, even in the midst of the, of the positives uh, for this congregation. He has a few things against them. You know, compromise um, can be a very dangerous thing. I think sometimes we want to compromise to keep friendships, you know, to keep relationships. Um, there's no compromising when you're doing God's will, period. I mean, he's not going to put up with it. He's not, God's not going to tolerate us compromising with the world. So here's what they're told. Repent, verse 16. There you go. You need to repent. Here's your warning. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against, uh, fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And again, that draws our attention back to Revelation chapter 1. Jesus is the one that has the sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth. That's a reference to his word. That's a reference to his judgment. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The instrument that we use to judge today is the Word of God. That's the sharp two-edged sword that's going to judge people. Now look at the promises in verse 17. Uh, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. The hidden manna. You'll remember when the uh, Ark of the Covenant was built, there were three things placed in the Ark of the Covenant. One of those things was a golden pot full of manna that the children of Israel ate during the wilderness wanderings. You can read about it in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4. So the, the indication here is a relationship with God. The Ark of the Covenant was where God would meet with the high priest once a year. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, you had that pot of manna. Well, if you overcome, you can have fellowship with God. You'll be given a white stone. This is very interesting. You might just note this. Look at Acts, or write down and read Acts chapter 21, uh, 26 and verse 10. When Paul was talking about how he used to persecute the church, he said, I gave my voice against them. The Greek literally reads, I cast my stone against them. Same word here in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. And these stones were often used. It's actually a small, uh, smooth pebble. Sometimes in court cases, they would have black and white. Black meant guilty, white meant not, meant not guilty. Well, if you overcome, you're pronounced not guilty. And you get to eat of the hidden manna, and you get a new name. And you're the only one who's going to know that name. So I can't say a lot about that, because <laughs> uh, I get a name, you get a name, I'll know mine, you'll know yours. But we're promised something new if we overcome. Pretty interesting promises there in Revelation chapter 2 and verse, uh, verse 17. All right, and then we go to verse, um, beginning in verse 18, we have, again, this is the longest of the seven letters to the churches of Asia, to the church at Thyatira. And um, so what we just looked at, Pergamos, you have doctrinal compromise. Thyatira, you have moral compromise. So we'll talk about that for just a little bit. 
That's their diagnosis. Now, what are the positives? Let's look at Jesus' description of himself first. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and has feet like fine brass. Well, that's Revelation chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Eyes like fire, penetration. He can see through you. He knows you. Feet of brass has to do with power and judgment, um, trampling the enemy, things like this. So let's look at their positives. Verse uh, verse 19, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. Again, perseverance, endurance. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So this is great. That sounds great. A faithful congregation who is busy doing the Lord's work. You go down to verse um, 24. Uh, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. So a lot of good about this church, no question about it. But here's the thing, a, a congregation, a local congregation is made up of many members. What are their problems? So let's look at their ne uh, negatives beginning in verse 20. I have a few things against you. Notice what it says here. Because you allow... All right, there's your compromise. You permit. You're allowing this to happen. Someone by the name of Jezebel, again, whether it's a, a woman who's literally named Jezebel or somebody who brings to mind the Jezebel of the Old Testament, all right, Ahab's wife, an evil woman. Whatever the case may be, notice what she's teaching in the church. She calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and seduces my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. It's not good. You've got a woman in the church um, who's teaching some very bad things. Well, what's going to happen? I gave her time to repent, and she did not repent. All right, there you have the, the patience of God, the long-suffering of God. And so here's what I'm going to do. I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into a great tribulation unless they repent. So not only had he given her past tense time to repent, but here's a warning and I will still give you some time to repent. It says unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death. In other words, those that follow this doctrine, they're going to suffer the same uh the same fate. And it's not that Jesus is literally going to strike them dead. I think we're talking about spiritual death here. Part of this congregation was morally compromised. And if they didn't repent, they're, they're, they're dead in their trespasses and sins, like, like the Ephesians were, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, before they came to Christ. Um, let's see. Okay, so then you notice the end of verse 23. And I'll give to each one of them according to their... Um, according to your works, to each one of you, according to your works. That's the nature of God's judgment. He judges each one of us individually based on what we do or do not do. Now, one of, one of the things that makes this a, one of the longer letters, and I'm actually, my video is lasting a little longer than I had anticipated today, but that's okay. Beginning in verse 26 through verse 29, you have the promises that are made. Um, again, those who have not known the depths of Satan, I'm not going to require any more of you. That You're faithful, all right? You're doing what's good. I'm not going to put any more on you. But hold on to what you have. And if you overcome and keep my works to the end, I will give him power over the nations. And then you look at verse 27. Verse 27 is actually a, a quote from Psalm chapter 2, which is talking about the reign of Christ. So what's the point? Well, faithful, if you stay faithful, you're going to continue reigning with Christ. That's the promise here. And, uh, you know, Christians today are reigning with Christ. He's on his throne right now. Um, and verse 28, I will give him the morning star. Morning star, it's, uh, interesting thought here. Um, the, the relationship that one has with Jesus Christ, um, the reward that you have for being with him who is the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, again, three of these four have both positives and negatives. And all the positives are good. Now, again, Smyrna, verses 8 through 11, they had nothing negative. That's wonderful. Here's the thing. If a congregation has negatives, 
they need to repent of them, period. And if they don't, as he said to the church in Ephesus, I'm going to take your lampstand. You're going to, you're going to lose your position as an influence in this world for good. You're not going to be a child of light anymore. Um, was it Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, walk as children of light? Well, sometimes an entire congregation may need to repent, like Ephesus, and sometimes, like we just read in Thyatira, there are just certain people within a congregation, and it may be a group of people, who need to repent of maybe doctrinal compromise or moral compromise, whatever the case may be. But again, the key word here through all these letters is overcome. You, you have all these good things, you have some bad stuff, but if you, if you hold on and you overcome, here are my promises to you. The book of Revelation was written to the seven churches of Asia Minor, but there's a lot for us to learn individually, but also collectively as a body. Um, and we have, we have to look forward to this overcoming as well. All right, guys, that's what I've got today. Like I said, this video went a little longer. I was trying to stay between 20 and 25. We're at 27 right now. I appreciate you staying on here with me. I don't see any questions in the uh, comment section here. I see a lot of greetings, and that's always nice to see. Glad everybody was on here today. If you have any further questions or comments, uh, uh, even after the video is over, you can still access the, the uh, comment section once the live stream is over. But I appreciate you being here today. Let's come back tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and we'll get into Revelation chapter 3, and we'll look at the final three of the seven churches of Asia. We'll look at their positives, their negatives, and the promises that are given to them. So thanks for being here today. Have a good day, and I will see you tomorrow.